project. Um, Dog Whistle Politics, oh, I'll, I'll hand these around. Uh, this is, uh, so, the, so the book is out. Actually, I talked to my publisher today. The book, the official release date is mid-January, but books will begin to ship uh, mid-December. But so for right now, things like this, photocopies, and this is a, a, a postcard with the cover of the book. And if you want, just grab one of those. Um, so the book is, the book is trying to link up a couple of phenomena. I, I think the two dominant phenomena in American politics today. Um, one of those is uh, economic inequality, rising economic inequality in the crisis of the middle class. Right? And in the, in the sense that, that there's something drastically wrong with the economy, that we're seeing levels of, of, of uh, uh, income inequality that we haven't seen in 100 years, that the Great Recession um, uh, is, uh, is enduring, and it's especially harsh for everybody outside of the top 1%. The top 1% have recovered quite well. Indeed, the top 1% have captured 95% of the sort of gains since the Great Recession of 2008, when everybody else is really suffering. So that's one major topic. The other major topic is racism. What's the role of race in American politics today? And we often hear this conversation in terms of opposition to Obama, perhaps in terms of opposition to Obamacare. Um, we also hear it increasingly in popular discourse. If, if you think about Trayvon Martin, if you think about Renisha McBride last week, there's an increasing conversation about what role race is playing in our society, um, coming in the context of, I'd say, several decades in which people have been moving increasingly towards a sense that this is a post-racial society, that we've actually transcended race. And what my project is doing is it's trying to link up these two conversations. And the argument is basically this. Growing, rising income inequality and racism are deeply linked because what we've seen over the last 50 years is a concerted effort to use coded racial appeals to turn people against liberal government. So that, um, and so I told a story yesterday, uh, sort of a hundred year story saying uh, the, from the Great Depression to the New Deal, we learned several lessons about effective uh, activist government and the role of government in providing uh, a, a safety net, the role of government um, in investing in infrastructure, the ro role of government in providing routes of upward mobility, in regulating the marketplace, and in preventing concentrations of wealth. We learned those lessons and there was a general consensus about how to create a middle class. And indeed, we saw the largest expansion of the middle class in the history of the world. Uh, through the New Deal, through the Johnson's uh, Great Society era. We've now turned against all of those programs and we're slowly dismantling them. What allowed us to turn against them? A new and rising rhetoric in which many voters came to understand that it wasn't concentrated wealth that was their greatest enemy, but instead it was minorities. Mm -hmm. And this rhetoric played on racial stereotypes uh, um, but they were always expressed in code. And so, thing, so some of the catchphrases were forced busing, states' rights, freedom of association, uh, welfare queen, illegal alien, uh, terrorist, uh, I would say Obamacare. The, all of these are phrases that on their surface do not mention race and indeed allow a sort of a strident denial that race has been invoked at all. And yet, just below the surface, there are strong racial undertones that have had the effect of um, tarnishing liberalism and um, stirring great racial anxiety. In which population? In a large segment of the white population. So when we look at the Republican Party, this is the open secret. This is Everybody knows this, but nobody talks about it. Republican Party today draws 90% of its support from whites. 98% of its elected officials are white. Now, an organization that homogenous in the United States is usually a fringe organization. But obviously, the GOP is no fringe organization. It's one of our two dominant political parties. right? And it's not fringe either in the level of support it draws. In the 2012 election, roughly three out of five whites supported the Republican Party. Right? So this is no fringe organization, and yet it's racially defined. But it's also something of an open secret in the sense that it's something we know, but nobody dares to talk about it. All right? So this is the talk that I sort of sketched out yesterday, mainly a sort of a historical political narrative. And so now uh, uh, I'm going to segue to talking about how race is working, how race has allowed this. Um, let me put it to you this way. How is it possible 
in a society that is committed to anti-racism, in a society committed to racial egalitarianism, that one of our two major parties is essentially defined by race and has used race as a wedge issue to demonize government. How is that possible? And especially, how is that possible where one of our two major parties is doing this racial demonization and our other major party has an incredible megaphone and countless opportunities to respond and yet has failed to respond effectively? Right? How is this possible at all? Okay, so that's going to be that's going to be what I'm going to talk about today. Um, let me also say in this context, um, I think the story I told yesterday is right in its basic contours. That is, I told a story yesterday about politics over the last 50 years, or arguing politics over the last 100 years. I'm not a political scientist, not much of a historian. Um, I'm confident in the overall contour. I think there's other, you know, details I may get wrong. Da, 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 a lot of ways to supplement the analysis. I think the narrative, the, the, the political narrative, will pull people through the book. But just between you, me, and now that the electronic recordings are off, just us, the real contribution of the book is not the political narrative. Because people know the political narrative. They, have, they already know this. I mean, this history is so well known that two different chairs of the Republican National Committee have admitted to it in public and apologized for it. It's not a secret. What people don't know, and the real contribution of this book is the race analysis. Um, so, I, you know, I'm a, I am mainly a race scholar, and I think that's what I'm really bringing to bear. I should also say, just in terms of the organization of the book, is reflected in the organization book, I don't think I could sell this book as a race book. People are tired of race. They don't want to hear about it. They don't want to read about it. And so, when I, first, when I was first going to write this, I, I actually had a, a two-part structure. I was going to do political analysis up until 2012, first half of the book, race analysis, second half of the book, and I realized no one would read the second half of the book. They just wouldn't, because people already, they think they understand race, they're kind of tired of it. So what I did is I ended up breaking up the race chapters and I, and I interwove them with the narrative chapters. So the book does one chapter on narrative, and then you gotta, then you gotta take your medicine and read a chapter on race. Then another chapter on political history, then some more medicine, right? Mm -hmm. But I, I actually, you know, informally I really, think that if this book is going to make a difference, it's going to make a difference because it's going to shift the, the conversation, uh, shift the vocabulary on race. Okay. So let me, so, so here's what I'm trying to argue in the book. Um, I'm going to start uh, with three parts basically today. One, part one on racisms, and it's important that it's in the plural. <coughs> part two on racial ideology, and in particular colorblindness, and part three on post-racialism, which is another way of saying colorblindness. Okay. Um, racisms. So I think that we operate today, well, well so, so to begin with, it's clear that any complex social phenomena is going to have multiple manifestations. So this whole idea that we should talk about racism in the singular is just kind of ludicrous. On the other hand, that we talk about racism in the singular is not accidental, it actually reflects a political project. And I'll, and I'll talk about that in, in a little bit. But obviously there's going to be multiple racisms. What are our dominant understandings of racism? Um, probably the predominant model now is racism is hate. This is the idea that the racist is a sort of um, a hate-filled or malicious bigot. Um, under this model, racism is very easy to understand. It's somebody spewing racial epithets as they do something heinous. You can, you know, think. I mean, uh, uh, imagine George Zimmerman with epithets pulling the trigger, right? But now you have to imagine because we can't be sure. Da da da. Okay, but but that but that's one understanding of racism. Um, another understanding of racism is that racism is is institutional. You can see this responding to the individual uh, ra uh, racism as hate model by saying, well, it's not really about <coughs> individuals. It's actually about social structures. Right? And so this notion was introduced in the late civil rights movement, uh, 1967 or 68, by Stokely Carmichael, who said, look, in Birmingham, Birmingham Alabama, uh, when Klan members set a bomb in a church that kills five little girls, that's individual racism. That's racism as hate. But when in the Birmingham, Alabama, over the course of a year, 500 black children die of malnutrition, that's institutional racism. Right? And now, 
people understand institutional racism as a radical concept. Why? As an analytic matter, there's nothing radical about it at all. Of course, social institutions perpetuate themselves through inertia. That's obvious. I mean, it would be astounding if that weren't the case, right? So, so of course, once something is built into the structures of society, it will tend to replicate itself over and over again unless there's some sort of an intervention. Nothing radical about that at all. What is radical about institutional racism is if you believe that those social structures are producing immoral and unjust results, that implies a duty to do something about it. And so it's radical because institutional racism says, hey, we need to change the structures of society. Right? And that, but that, it, it's only radical in its implications. In its analysis, it's, it's completely um, uh, simple and obvious. On the other hand, notice that it has been largely delegitimized so that you very rarely hear anybody talk about institutional racism. And when you do hear somebody talk about institutional racism, you can be, you can be sure they're on the left fringe of the political uh, spectrum. Because otherwise, nobody's talking about this one. Okay, so that's two. Um, probably the most popular understanding of racism now among liberal critics of the hate model would be unconscious racism and, and even more narrowly implicit bias. Uh, so I, I, if you haven't taken the implicit association test, it's available online, easy to look up, uh, very easy to take, usually pretty startling in its results. But essentially the argument is, um, uh, we have these unconscious conceptions of race that operate in the background. They operate uh, very quickly. They skew our judgments in ways that we don't recognize uh, and in ways that are very difficult to control. And we almost all have them. Uh, and if you want to see them operating in yourself, then you go online and take the implicit association test and, and it'll, it'll track your own sort of implicit biases. Okay. I like all of those models. Um, uh, I have some concerns. I, we, can, we can talk more about the strengths and shortcomings of those models. But, but here's the main point that I want to drive at. When you think about politicians who are purposefully manipulating race to get elected, or you think about the Koch brothers and these think tanks who are purposefully stirring racial agitation to forward their own political agendas, which sort of racism is that? Is it hate? I mean, you know, Richard Nixon was definitely a bigot. But on the other hand, um, uh, Barry Goldwater, before he launched this sort of race baiting, was actually a moderate Republican in terms of race. He voted for two civil rights bills before he voted against the 19 civil, 1964 Civil Rights Act. Right? So, I, you know, I mean, there's, there are <coughs> bigots, but it doesn't seem like it's bigotry that's driving this. On the other hand, is it structural or institutional? Well, it can't be that. The structural or institutional model is a model of racism without racists. The structural model says this is just going to happen through, the, through institutions. You know, the, the individuals don't even matter in this account. And it's certainly there's nothing institutional that's driving this. Is it unconscious? No, the hallmark of dog whistle politics is that it's purposeful. Right? So our three dominant models of racism don't give us a way to understand people who are blowing a dog whistle. They don't give us a way to understand racial demagogues. So I want to propose, instead of fourth understanding of racism, I want to propose something called strategic racism. And I want to define strategic racism as the calculated manipulation of racial animosity in contests over power, status, or wealth the calculated manipulation of racial animosity in contests over power, status, or wealth. For me, that's dog whistle politics. You've got these politicians who are asking themselves the central question all politicians ask themselves. How do I get elected? Or how do I get reelected? And as they cast about for different mechanisms, they see race lying around as a tool. And they say, if I agitate voters on racial grounds, I can get elected. I mean, so I didn't, this is a quote from George Wallace. I, I didn't talk about George Wallace too much yesterday. But, but George, Wallace is an, uh, George Wallace and Barry Goldwater are contemporaries. George Wallace was the uh, governor of Alabama. 
and an another, another one of the early movers towards dog whistle politics. Wallace ran as a racial moderate in 1958 and lost. The night he lost, he is reputed to have said to his cronies, no other son of a bitch is ever going to outnigger me again. By which he meant he'd never again run as a racial moderate, that he'd begin to run as a racial reactionary. In 1962, he won as a racial reactionary, and you all may have heard of him because of his 1963 inaugural address where he said segregation now, segregation, segregation now, to, uh, tomorrow, and forever. Right. Wallace also said, I tried talking about schools and buses, and I couldn't make them listen. Then I started talking about niggers, and they stomped the floor. This is, this is a politician who is not, I mean, he's got his racism, but he's not an angry bigot. He wants to get elected. And he's looking around for how to get elected, and race is the answer. Right? And it's, so he's, he's manipulating racial animosity, not out of hatred, but because it works. And it works to get himself elected. He is manipulating racial animosity in a contest over power, in this case, political power. OK, several points. One, this is not to say that strategic racists stand completely outside of race. They are not omniscient. They are not uh, these um, uh, social, socially omniscient actors who see clearly how these complex phenomena work. They're strategic, but they're also embedded. Right? That is, he's going to, when they draw, when they propagate this sort of racism, they're also going to be drawing upon stereotypes, unconscious biases, cultural norms, all of this stuff, right? So they are not standing completely outside of it. They are not sort of masterminds in that sense. But unlike most racists, they are thinking long and hard about the advantages of racism to themselves. That's the first point. Second point. With strategic racism, it's not really about race. And this is a little bit confusing, but here's what I mean. The point of strategic racism is power, status, wealth. If they had some other way to get power, status, or wealth, they'd use it. And often they do, and so you often see race being used in conjunction with other means. right? So you can think about, um, uh, uh, we can think about in 2012, 2010, all of the sort of political mobilization around abortion and gender. Right? That too is operating as a sort of cultural provocation that people are using to stir voters and to win votes. Or you can think about all the campaigning, campaigning against gay rights. That too is a way of stirring voters, warning them about the dangers of social liberalism to convince them to vote against, to, to convince them to vote for politicians who are ultimately going to strike out against economic liberalism. Right? It's not fundamentally about race. It's about power, status, and wealth. Right? And so when we, when we think, um, uh, you know, why are these, you know, are, are, are these people racist? Da, 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 you know, we often think the racist is the person who wants to hurt minorities. But these strategic racists, they don't really care whether they hurt minorities. Now, they do a tremendous amount of damage to minority communities. It's not the, that's not the intent. That's not what's driving them. It's, it's, it's a, an utterly predictable result. But what they're really after is power, status, wealth. And the rest of us are just collateral damage. Right. Now, having said that it's not about race, I want to say that strategic racism is nevertheless <laughs> I want to say that strategic racism is nevertheless at the heart of racism. It is more fundamental to racism and to the evolution of race than these other forms of racism that we commonly talk about. And here I want to step back for a second and, and ask you to think about the origins of race itself. Okay. Race arose in North America as a way to justify the appropriation of Native Americans lands and the expropriation of African labor. Taking away people's land or enslaving them through violence to take their labor and never pay them, that requires an extraordinary amount of violence, of coercion, of brutality, of inhumanity. How can you do that to people? You can only do that to people if you invent a narrative in which 
it is not you that's doing it. It's something else. Maybe it's God who's ordained these positions. Or maybe it's nature, which has put people in a natural hierarchy. But it's so much easier to exploit and brutalize people. If you can tell yourself, it's not really me. In fact, it's out of my control. God or nature demands this organization of society. Right? <laughs> so an ideology of race is created. And, and race wasn't the first sort of ideology. Right? Ori originally, when you look at the 1600s in terms of Native American dispossession and the enslavement of blacks, the, the, the original rhetoric was in terms of either civilized and savage or Christian heathen. Those proved relatively unstable. Race as a set of fundamental differences, ostensibly evident in physical differences, was a much more stable system to justify these sorts of brutalities. You can understand race then as having origins in what I'm calling strategic racism. Race itself originates in an effort to manipulate racial animosity, to manipulate these categories and their hatreds in a way that's going to justify contests over power, status, and wealth including slavery, including Native American dispossession. And it's exactly this sort of strategic racism that keeps race uh, evolving relatively rapidly. At every turn, when racism is contested, when it's challenged, when it's delegitimized, it changes form. Right? And you can think about this in terms of slavery. Once slavery is broken, it changes form, and it goes to convict leasing and debt peonage and Jim Crow. Once those are challenged, they change form. And, and we get, you know, Michelle Alexander would say racialized mass incarceration. I would say racialized mass incarceration as a small subset of dog whistle politics. How can race keep changing? How can it keep mutating so quickly? Because people can see an advantage in manipulating racial animosity. And they're manipulating this animosity not out of hate, but because they see an advantage to themselves in terms of wealth, status, or power. Right. You, you have what I would call racial entrepreneurs. They mm -hmm. see an advantage, and they, and they manipulate race. They do tremendous damage. It's not what they're after, but it is nevertheless the core of racism. Okay, so that's this, uh, that's this idea of strategic racism. And, and what I'm hoping, so there, 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 was, a, there was a study that, that came out, it was a recent study, 2008, something like this, presented, uh, presented uh, 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 respondents with a list of like 40 words to describe people. And then it said, of these 40 words, which most describes a racist? And you can imagine, you know, the three or four most common words were like closed-minded, hate-filled, ignorant. The least common words were smart, wealthy, cool. And what I'm saying is smart, wealthy, and cool, those are the most dangerous racists. Those are the strategic racists. Right? And we need to start to see that people can be smart, wealthy, and cool, and can be manipulating racial, racial animosity for their own advantage. Okay, so that's, so that's a strategic racism. I want to introduce another concept, and I'm going to call this common sense racism. I think strategic racism really defines those who are blowing the whistle, those who set out to manipulate racial ideas. I don't think it describes very well at all those who hear the whistle. <laughs> Okay. I think those who hear the whistle are engaged in something that I want to call common sense racism. Um, uh, let me start with this. I, I actually start the book with this story, and, and it's a, I think it's a very important story. Um, I'm hoping some Tea Partiers will at least read the preface and, and will read this story and will be encouraged to continue. I start the story by reflecting back on an experience I had. So when I was in law school, I did a... Um, human rights internship in South Africa, and, while I, and then from there I traveled to Namibia, which was then under South African control, and so it too was an apartheid state. Um, and in hitchhiking, I mainly, almost exclusively, got rides from whites, and at one point I got a ride, ride from a white farmer. Now, Nam Namibia, it's a beautiful country, but, it, but it's um, uh, quite dry, very long distances between towns. This farmer drove me two or three hours outside of, uh, uh, beyond his farmstead. But when we got to the, to the next town, he dropped me at the edge of the town. And he, he was really apologetic. And, and he said, I, I take you into the heart of town. But a week ago, I killed a kafir for poaching. So kafir is the, was the South African equivalent, Namibian equivalent of nigger. He said, I, I, I killed a kafir for poaching. 
and the constable has asked me to stay out of town for a week or two till things simmer down. Have a nice evening. Now, I had gone to South Africa with a very American understanding of racism, and that is that racists are sociopaths, right? That they're, they're just sick people. And yet, after four months there, and especially in this one ride, I'd been talking to this guy for several hours, and he was incredibly generous and genuine and interested in what I was doing and e even open and willing to talk to me about the fact that I was there as this American law student studying apartheid. And what, he's obviously a genuine, decent human being, capable of incredible brutality, capable of killing another person for the petty act of poaching. The guy said, he, he complained that the guy, that, that, that the man he killed had been stealing grapes. It's crazy. But what it made me realize, and, and this, is, this is where I start the book, is most racists are good people. Most racists are not sociopaths. Most racists are good people. They're good people reared in complex societies, located in, it, located in racially implicated institutions that make them disposed to hate-filled ideas and indeed make them capable of incredible acts of brutality. But most racists are good people. OK, to give content to that, I want to I want to use this idea of common sense racism. How do most people, uh, how does racism affect the thinking of most people? And, and here, I don't mean just whites, by the way. I, I, I think in a, in, a, in a racialized society like ours, this is something that, that common sense racism is, is something that afflicts white and non-white in different ways, but still to significant degrees. Um, common sense racism is largely unconscious. That is, it operates through our unconscious minds, it affects how we think, it affects our judgments, it affects how we categorize people. I mean, all, all the social psychological work shows that one of the first things our minds do when we see other people is we categorize them racially. Right? Well before we understand that that's what we're doing. Right? Um, but I really want to emphasize this is not your standard theory of unconscious racism. Your standard social psychological theory of unconscious racism treats the unconscious as if it's universal, as if everybody's unconscious works similarly. Right? And this has led to a dramatic misunderstanding. A friend of mine once said, um, Racism is hardwired into our reptilian brains, right? Like, like, it's, like he'd gotten the message that it was unconscious and that he didn't have control over it, but he translated it into it's hardwired into us. It's, it's natural. It's, it's, it's just part of the way humans think. That couldn't be more wrong. Our unconscious minds are predisposed to recognize and assign meaning to difference, but that the difference should take racial form says everything about our society and nothing about our minds. And that's, and that's crucial. Or uh, as John Powell, my colleague John Powell says, the unconscious is social. We seek out difference. That is, that is hardwired into our reptilian minds. But what counts as relevant difference reflects society. Right? OK, so a common sense racism I want to suggest that there are two, two main sources for, uh, for these background ideas that, 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 uh, uh, that in fact, how we think. One is social learning. And, and you know, I said two main. Social learning, that is huge, right? But, but that is from your family, <laughs> um, uh, uh, from media, from education. We're constantly being bombarded with notions, ideas about how race works, and there are huge literatures in each of these fields, how, how education teaches about, about uh, race, how the media teaches about race, uh, how, how children learn about race in their families. I want to suggest that a core part of social learning is actually is politicians and the messages they spread. And all these dog whistle themes about the threat from illegal aliens, the threat from terrorists, the threat from welfare chiselers, uh, the threat from gangbangers, the threat from criminals, right? All of that, that, that is a constant, constant drumbeat in our society. That, too, is part of the social learning that tells people about the salience of race. Second main way people learn about race is the environment. 
And by the environment, I mean our built environment. So after centuries of racism, of course there are profound manifestations of racism in our built environment. And so all of that's really abstract. But um, you know, you could think about, I presume you could think about a place like the University of Wisconsin, uh, Madison. Now, I started here as a professor in 93, 94. It was an overwhelmingly white space. What made it so white? Right? It, that had to do with patterns of immigration, but that also had to do with patterns of exclusion of who was not allowed into the country. It also has to do with patterns of wealth, who was able to benefit from the New Deal program that launched millions of whites into the middle class, but that benefited almost no non-whites. Right? There's all of this history behind our environment that reflects centuries of racism, but which we can't see. But what we do see is an environment. And in that environment, you can easily move from, let's say, a University of Wisconsin-Madison campus to some of the ghettos of Milwaukee. And those, too, reflect uh, centuries of different racial politics. But what you see is the environment. And what the environment tells you constantly, subconsciously, are things like this. Minorities are lazy. They're, they don't take care of themselves, they don't take care of their environment, they, they, they litter, they lounge about, they're always hanging out on street corners, they wear baggy clothes, whites are hard working, they're decent, they have good teeth, they work hard. Right Now all of these things, you're bombarded with this in your unconscious, and it's all from the environment. Right? And the environment itself is reflecting a long legacy of racism. Now, a couple, one, one more comment about this. When you think about social learning, you think about the environment, this is a circular relationship with racial learning, because social learning teaches you about the superiority of whites and the inferior minorities, and we act on it, and we confirm that, and it gets replicated through social learning. And there's, you know, there's, a, there's a great example of this. I, I talked about it in the book. Um, there was a teacher, I, I think she was in Iowa, um, in the wake of Martin Luther King's assassination. And she was an elementary school teacher. She taught, she had a class full of just of, of white students. And she, and she wanted to give them a sense of what the assassination of this man meant, this man who was understood to be fighting for integration. And so she took her students and she divided them between blue-eyed and brown-eyed students. Uh, and on the first day, she put felt collars all around the necks of all of the brown-eyed students. And she put them in the back of the room. And she pulled to the front of the room all of the blue-eyed students and was receptive and open and talkative with the blue-eyed students, always calling on them, but ignored the brown-eyed students. And she watched as the brown-eyed students, these are little kids, as they retreated into themselves, as they became really self-conscious, as they lost confidence, and, and, and as their performance, when she did call on them, uh, uh, their, their performance, they stumbled, they fumbled, they, they fell apart. And then the next day, she flipped it. And she put the colors on the blue-eyed ki uh, blue kids, and she brought the brown-eyed kids, and the same thing happened. And, and, she, and she wrote about this experience, and it was incredibly affecting, because what she was showing is, if you treat people like dirt, you will have a profound impact on how they behave. And the way that they end up behaving is exactly the way that th becomes the stereotypes which we then say, characterize minorities, that justifies us treating them like they're in the first, first place. Right? Social learning is circular. You treat people badly because you believe they're inferior. It will, they will react in ways that confirm your beliefs about their inferiority and justify you continuing to treat them badly. And the environment works the same way. You have an environment that tells you whites are superior, hardworking, decent, and law-abiding, and you treat white people that way, that will have a self-fulfilling effect. You have an environment that makes you think on an unconscious level, minorities are dangerous and lawbreakers and irresponsible, and you treat them that way, and that's what you'll have. Right? So all of these are circuits. Okay, so common sense through social learning through the environment. Um, common sense racism <coughs> also through cognitive dynamics. Right? And this is just to pick up these, these earlier points. We categorize difference automatically. We categorize it quickly. Um, uh, I, I'd say that there's, and, and there's one more sort of cognitive dynamic I'd, I'd highlight, loss aversion. People don't usually talk about this in terms of race, but I think it's very important. People experience 
deprivations of something much more as, 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 as much more severely than they than they sorry let me let me do this not abstractly if somebody has five dollars and you take it away they really get agitated it really pisses them off whereas if you promise them five dollars but you never give it to them they don't care so much now from a rational point of view either way you're out they're out five bucks and they should care equally but that's not how it works cognitively if you take away something that somebody already has they really resent it if you fail to give them something you promised is not experienced so severely. What does this mean? We are trying to move from a society that has, in almost every sphere, given whites privilege and status over non-whites. We're trying to move from that society to a racially egalitarian society, and many whites experience that as a loss. Something is being taken away from them. Their privileged position is not experienced as privilege, but as the norm as a just do, and when you try and take it away, people are furious. Right? So, okay, so all of these cognitive dynamics give rise to what I'm calling common sense racism, and it's this common sense racism, it's the way in which racial ideas about whites as hardworking and decent, uh, as true Americans, as minorities, as lazy and undeserving, as threatening, as, as a threat to America, easily uh, speak to large, large groups of Americans. And, and now, at different levels, but speak to large groups of Americans forcefully enough to become a, a readily available tool for demagogic politicians. So on the one hand, you have these strategic racists, who by the way themselves are also drawing on common sense racism, but you have these strategic racists who are purposefully casting about for ways to manipulate animosity and do so. And then you have common sense racism affecting all the rest of us in a way that makes a large number of us susceptible to this sort of agitation. A couple of comments. Notice that I have not told a story about individual male disposition. I want you to, I mean, if you're paying attention to the literature about conservatism in the United States and the, and the sort of the rise of the right wing, a lot of that literature tells stories about individual disposition. Either it tells stories about individual framing, or it tells stories about social dominance orientation, right? Or it tells stories, right? There's a lot of stories about individuals. I don't find that compelling. Well, I, 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 that's important, but it doesn't explain the sort of shift that I was showing yesterday. Yesterday I showed a flip among whites who voted, 65% of whites voted for Lyndon Johnson in 64, and 70% of whites voted for Richard Nixon in 1972. There's a dramatic shift in the sort of politics of the country over just eight years. That's not individual disposition at work. Or similarly, if 60% if of whites uh, uh, vote for the Republican Party, um, uh, something well under 5% of African Americans do. Conservatism is not best explained through individual disposition. It's much better explained through large cultural dynamics like racial ideology. Right? So, that, so that's the first point. Second point. If you think about strategic racism and common sense racism, it seems that they exist on a spectrum of motivation. That on one end of the spectrum, the strategic racists are, are self-conscious, purposeful, they're, they're motivated in that self-conscious sense. And on the other, common sense racism, I can say most racists are good people because I can say something like they're susceptible to common sense racism, but they don't intend it. They're not motivated to be racist, right? And, and, and thus, this is part of the way we understand them as good people, as we say, in their motives, in their intentions, they don't mean ill. Okay. But I want to I, I wanna complicate that a little bit. I've already said strategic racists are not completely omniscient. They themselves draw on common sense racism, so it's not fully motivated and strategic. Now I want to come back and say of common sense racism. Motivation and conscious intent don't neatly overlap. Sometimes motives are a function of intent. But motives actually operate in a psychologically much more complex manner, so that people can be unconsciously motivated to protect their self-image or to protect themselves from discomfort. All right? And so 
uh, um, uh, I'm going to start talking about racial ideology in a, in a moment. So I was using social psychology language, but I could use, switch the language of, of, of sociology. A lot of times people say ideology is a way of understanding the social world. But that's a completely depoliticized, jejune way of talking about it. Ideology is a way of solving pressing social problems. It gives us a story about why it's OK uh, that we're oppressing these people, or why it's OK that we close our borders, or um, uh, why we should fight. Right? It's solving pressing social problems. Whites face a pressing social problem in an anti-racist society. They have to explain to themselves why their social position isn't unjust. It's a pressing problem. You can't be white in this society 50 years after the Civil Rights Movement without wondering in what way am I implicated in what we all understand as a rank injustice. And you may do this consciously, but many whites do. And, and, and probably if you're at the University of Wisconsin, you're pressed to do this consciously. But for many whites, they're grappling with this unconsciously. And in this sense, Seeking, to a, seeking an understanding, it's seeking understandings of race that, of, that, that save their self-image, or seeking understandings of race that, that shield them from discomfort. What discomfort? The discomfort, sometimes the discomfort of interracial interaction. Other times the discomfort of risking talk about race, uh, especially in mixed race setting, right? People end up adopting understandings of racism that are, in this sense, self-serving. The common sense, common sense racism isn't accidental. Common sense racism itself has important ideological dimensions. It becomes common sense for the dominant elements of society when it helps them protect their self-image and insulate themselves from discomfort. Right? And so to understand common sense racism as sort of, sort of outside of people and purely unconscious and purely unmotivated, no, that's a mistake. It has a dimension in which it is, it, it, it aims to protect people from discomfort and also to protect their self-image. Okay? And so now I'm gonna, so now I'm gonna switch to the next part of the talk in which I talk more forthrightly about how racial ideology has evolved over the last 50 years. Okay? Um, so, because I've been talking about racism kind of in the abstract, but of course there's a set of important ideas uh, that people are drawing on. I think, the, I think the quintessential racial ideology of today is colorblindness. And so I want to talk about colorblindness and how this fits in with dog whistle politics. So colorblindness is this idea that we best get beyond race, we best address racism uh, or, or racial inequality by not talking about race and by refusing to see it, right, by refusing to note it. We should be clear that colorblindness has strong liberal roots. Um, uh, you, can, you, can, you can recall phrases like, um, uh, we're all the same under the skin, or everybody bleeds the same. And these are, these, are, these are phrases that came out of the 1940s, 1950s, out of the civil rights movement as a way to proclaim our basic humanity. But I think it's really important to understand how colorblindness has been hijacked and has become a reactionary ideology. Okay. When colorblindness as a liberal doctrine was saying we're all basically the same, it was responding to a white supremacist understanding of race. So we need to go back a little bit to, say, John Marshall Harlan, Plessy. I, I, so, so I don't know. If, so so the, the term colorblindness comes out of John Marshall Harlan's dissent in Plessy. I don't know if you folks have read the paragraph, right? So he says, you know, our Constitution is colorblind, but he starts that, par that same paragraph by saying, I have, uh, you know, the white race is a dominant race in this country, and so I doubt not it will remain for all time. Right? So, so you have a single paragraph in which he says, white supremacy, yeah, that's just given, but we should be colorblind. So clearly, colorblindness can't mean what the way. Okay, never mind. <laughs> when John Marshall Harlan was writing, race was understood this way. Race was understood as fundamental differences in temperament and culture that explained the superiority of whites and the misery of 
African Americans and Mexican Americans and Native Americans. You me think of 1890. These are very poor, very exploited populations who live in miserable conditions in hovels and filth versus whites, uh, um, many of whom also were very poor and lived in miserable conditions, but almost all, almost all of the rich were white. Right? How to explain these differences? So race was a way to attribute this to culture and temperament given physical manifestation through skin, through facial features, through hair. We tend to think about race now, when we say it's biological, we tend to think about it as if there was an ideology that emphasized the skin and the face and the hair. No. It emphasized the cultural and temperamental differences that ostensibly produced these dramatically different social situations. It was a story about innate differences in culture and temperament, and intelligence, and capacity, ordained by God or nature, and reflected in physical differences like skin or hair or facial features. Right? It was always culture, temperament, and skin and face. Skin and face was not the most important. It was culture and tem temperament. And culture and temperament was the most important because that's what was ostensibly explaining the superior and inferior social positions of these different groups. By the 1940s, you get people like Gun Gunnar Myrdal, an American dilemma, saying, Race is only skin color. Right? We are all the same under the skin. It's just a superficial dis uh, difference. And what he means is the biological doesn't explain different social positions. There are different social positions, he says, but they are rooted in social practices. And so he has this incredible line where he says, um, uh, uh, the determinants of the differences between the position of the white and the Negro will be found in social practices on the white side of the color line. Right? So this is kind of Myrtle saying, you want to understand the different social positions of whites and blacks, you need to look at what whites do to blacks. Look at social practices. But as far as nature is concerned, it's just skin color. Right? This was color blindness in the 1940s and the 1950s. Don't don't use biology to justify different forms of social oppression. Look to the social oppression for the sources of differences between the races and, and that social oppression. This was not adopted by the court. Um, uh, the court decided it was going to dismantle Jim Crow piecemeal. It never adopted a sort of a blanket prohibition on any, uh, on any use of race. And I'm thinking of Brown versus Board of Education. Um, uh, but almost immediately, well, I'll say, let's say by 1964. By 1964, conservatives realized that they could hijack colorblindness as a way to oppose integration. Who was one of the first persons to realize this? Barry Goldwater. So I talked about Goldwater yesterday and the way in which he campaigned as a, uh, sort of on, on states' rights and freedom of association. Late in the campaign, he had to give a national address, and he really feared uh, on the one hand, he knew that he had to continue as an opponent of the civil rights movement. But on the other hand, talking about race outside of the South, he, feel, he feared that he'd come off as a bigot. So he employed uh, somebody that the law people among you might recognize to help him write a speech. He employed William Rehnquist. William Rehnquist had been a clerk on the Supreme Court when Brown versus Board of Education had been decided, and as a clerk had written that Plessy was right and that segregation should continue. By the 1960s, uh, uh, Rehnquist had shifted, and he had become another one of these defenders of freedom of association. When he helped Goldwater write his 64 speech, he introduced the idea of colorblindness as a bar on integration. And what Rehnquist, what Goldwater said, drawing on Rehnquist was, colorblindness should forbid segregation, but it should also forbid the state from using race to force integration because colorblindness should be understood as a bar of any use of race. Right? As if the problem with race was making a distinction on the basis of a physical characteristic, rather than using an ideology of natural difference to justify oppression. Right? And, and you see the difference. So modern colorblindness, modern colorblindness seizes on the idea that race is just physical, but it drops the idea that race connects to social patterns that determine inferior and superior positions. 
And this is not an accident. This is a really important ideological move. Watch what happens. First, if race is just a matter of physical differences, then racism cannot be found in the general social context. It won't exist in institutions. Racism can only exist when somebody expressly mentions race. And so in 1979, the Supreme Court, with William Rehnquist and Lewis Powell sitting on it, and over the objections of Thurgood Marshall, write an opinion saying, if you want to prove discrimination, you have to show that, somebody, that, that, that uh, the state acted with the equivalent of malice. You have to show an express malicious invocation of race or gender to prove discrimination. With what result? Since that 1979 decision, using that reasoning, the Supreme Court has not once found discrimination against minorities. Not once. Now, you might quibble and say, well, I, maybe you can think of There's a couple of cases in which they did find discrimination against minorities, but only when one of the right-wing justices switched his vote and went back to the prior understanding of discrimination. Using discrimination as malice, Supreme Court, has not found discrimination against minorities since Jimmy Carter was in the White House. That was 79. In 78, Justice Powell wrote an opinion that said, when it comes to affirmative action, the constitutional harm is disconnected from intent. It doesn't matter whether there's malice or whether there's an intent to promote integration. It has nothing to do with intent. The sole harm is whether you've used race at all. And once that became the test, there was a, a, a sort of a period of contestation in the 80s that solidified as the test in the 90s. And since then, in all but two affirmative action cases, the Supreme Court has struck down affirmative action as racism <coughs> against whites. And those two um, uh, are Grutter and Fisher, the higher education affirmative action cases, and Fisher's holding on by a thread. In effect, we have a colorblind Supreme Court doctrine now that almost invariably finds no discrimination against minorities because no one expressly mentioned race, and at the same time almost always finds discrimination against whites because in the context of affirmative action, somebody said race. Right? And that's how colorblindness is working doctrinally. I want to suggest that socially it's doing even more damage. What, how does, what is colorblindness doing as a way of understanding race? It is telling whites there is no more racism against minorities. Because it's telling whites there is only one meaning to racism, the express use of race. For example, through a racial epithet, or at least through an express mention of like black or Latino. And so whites look around and say, I don't see anybody using epithets. I don't see anybody saying black or Latino as they disfavor minority communities. I don't see any successful discrimination cases in the Supreme Court, and the result is a sense that discrimination against minorities is over. Second, it is telling whites there are no good reasons to have remedial programs to end racial inequality. Right? Because all of the rationales for remedial programs depend upon the social connection, the, 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 the sort of um, the social dynamics that connect up race to, to, to uh, inequality. Um, the way in which these, these processes replicate themselves, the way in which unconscious racism <coughs> works, the way in which, right, all, all but, but if you insist that race is only skin color, then it seems as if there are no social dynamics that connect race to inequality. And if there are no social dynamics that connect race to inequality, then there's no good reason to remedy inequality. And, and the quintessential example of this is Clarence Thomas saying of affirmative action, it's an aesthetic effort to, for, for, for universities who want to, um, what, how does he say it? Um, who care about the color of the, the, of the furniture, the color of the paint, and the color of the students. Right? And this is dramatic, because he's saying, it's just color, it's just aesthetics. You can paint your walls green, you can paint some of your students black, and that's, they're on the same level. There's no connection between skin color and larger social processes. Right? So there's no good reason for racial remedies. Third, racial remedies are themselves racism against whites. And how do we know that? Because racial remedies say race expressly in a way that disfavors whites. And that is, under colorblindness, the very definition of racism. 
So with a colorblind understanding of race as just skin color, you get a powerful message to whites. A, there's no more racism against minorities. B, there's no need to do anything about racial inequality because it has nothing to do with racism. C, there's lots of racism today and you're the victim. That's an incredible ideology. How well does it play out? Um, uh, something like 70% of Republicans believe racial discrimination against whites is as big a problem as racial discrimination against blacks. I mean, that's absurd, except 50 years of this ideology that racism is over against minorities and pervasive against blacks, uh, against whites. Okay, um, let me go on. That's racist skin color. Racist skin color has a big problem for conservatives. If race just is skin color, then what does explain reality? I mean, whites look around, they're not dumb. They see these big differences, and, 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 and they know that we're not all just the same under the, under the skin, right? And they know, so what does explain it? And so colorblindness also shifts to a second understanding of race. And it is a contradictory understanding of race, but that's okay, because it works. Race as ethnicity. So you might have noticed whites have all but disappeared in terms of public discourse. And they've been supplanted with Irish Americans, Italian Americans, Jews, German Americans, Scandinavians, right? There has been a disaggregation of whites. And what does this do? It says there are no races, but there are ethnicities. And an ethnicity is a group defined by a culture. And group culture is what ultimately explains group success. Okay, how does this play out? First, it exonerates whites. Whites can't be responsible for discrimination because whites don't exist. Instead, there's just a welter of ethnic groups. Second, it celebrates whites. It says if you want to understand the success of people who look white, you really need to pay attention to Anglo-Saxon Protestant values or the hard work of Jews, or Italians in the self-help mentality, right? It's, it says there's this, it, it, it facilitates a cultural narrative about why these formerly white groups succeed. And it also facilitates a familiar narrative about why minorities fail, because they have inferior cultures. And it's their inferior cultures, it's their unwillingness to take responsibility, uh, the fact that they won't obey the law, that they refuse to work hard, uh, that they have, I remember when I was in law school, um, uh, Reagan's um, Secretary of Education said the problem with Latinos is you don't value higher education, you have a manana attitude. Mm -hmm. like, well, that was very helpful, he was a Latino too. Uh, super helpful, right? But, but notice, that the, that the, notice the way that this notion of ethnicity operates. It allows the return of what was the core of white supremacist styles of racism. Stories about why group culture and temperament explain group position. Not social structures, not social patterns, not practices, but group culture and temperament. Now, in white supremacist theory is group culture and temperament tied to biology. The contemporary move is to say, we won't mention biology. We're just going to talk about groups. We're going to talk about Muslims and the way in which their religion uh, inspires a disregard for the value of human life. We're going to talk about Mexicans and the way in which they have a manana attitude. Uh, we're going to talk about blacks and the way they refuse to take responsibility. Right? Now, now, blacks are a little bit tricky. People will not say blacks. They'll say inner city residents have no tradition of taking responsibility for themselves. Because black, I mean, all right, that, that's a little bit too close to race. But the language of culture and temperament is there. Right? Okay. How does this, how does this uh, uh, relate to dog whistle politics? So yesterday I said dog whistle politics has, has a three-part rhetorical strategy, punch, parry, and kick. The punch of dog whistle politics is to constantly insert racial insinuations into the conversation. It does so through ethnic discourse, right? Through a discourse of culture and difference, right? There are certain groups who aren't like us because they don't work hard, because uh, they're lazy because they're irresponsible, because they abuse welfare, because they commit crimes, because they sneak across the border, because they're terrorists, right? All of this rhetoric is culture and disposition. It's an ethnic discourse. But then if you turn around and say, 
hey, you know, all that rhetoric you're using, that sounds just like the old stereotypes. That's racism, dude. That sounds like the old stereotypes. Then you get the parry. And the parry is, I can't be racist because I didn't expressly mention race. And you recognize that. That's color blindness, racist skin color. You get to say it's not racism unless someone expressly mentions race. And, and it even goes beyond that. I don't know if you remember when um, a Tea Party crowd spat upon John Lewis and, and called him a nigger. And, and, and so John Lewis and a bunch of different con congressional representatives and a large crowd were, were talking about Lewis being spat upon and the crowd calling him a nigger. And the right responded by saying, do you have electronic evidence? Did you get that on video? Right? Because if you can't show it on video, then it's not enough that someone actually used the term. You actually have to have electronic evidence. Right? So it's, it's not going to be racism unless someone expressly uses an epithet. And just, and just marshalling the stereotypes, that's not racism. Right? OK. Uh, third, the kick. Punch, parry, and kick. The kick is, I'll be the, I'll be the racial demagogue saying all this, you know, I'll, I'll be, I'll be uh, um, uh, whatever, George Wallace, whoever. George Wallace is a good example. So George Wallace said in, in, in 1968 at one of his campaign rallies where he's wearing a law and order, breakdown of law and order, states' rights, and then he said, you know who the biggest bigots in the world are? They're the people who call you a bigot. Well, it's a sad day when you can't talk about law and order in America without someone calling you a bigot. And what's this move? It's to say, hey, I'm going to push race into the conversation, then I'm going to deny that I'm racist because I never said race itself, and then I'm going to point out that the first person in the room who said race was the person who criticized me, and that makes that person the racist. And it flips the charge. Right? And, he, and, he's, and, and so you have, you have George Wallace in 1968 saying, I'm not a bigot, I never mentioned race, but you just accused me of bigotry. And that's bigotry. You're the bigot. Right? And so, the, and so, you know, I, I, I don't know how many times, right? But, but who's the person who gets called a racist in public conversations? Me. I'm the racist because I keep talking about race, right? And that's the standard kick. And what has been the result of this? This strategy has been so effective that the Democratic Party has decided en masse that they will never talk about race. And now they stumble every so often and mention the obvious. Obama did in 2008 when he said, you know, McCain's going to try and scare you by saying, I don't look like all those other presidents on the dollar bills. Whereupon John McCain said, uh, John McCain's uh, uh, chairman said, uh, 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 McCain has worked all his life for racial equality. I can't believe that Obama would call him a racist. Right? And Obama said, or, or Obama spokesperson said, Obama never meant to call John McCain a racist. And, and in fact, when Obama talked about figures on dollar bills, he was just talking about the age of the presidents. Because <laughs> you wouldn't want to be the first person to actually mention race. Right? And remember, this is 2008 with Sarah Palin talking about Obama palling around with, with, with terrorists. New York Times was so outraged by the racial pandering of the McCain-Palin campaign that they actually called out McCain and Palin for racial demagoguery, which are very strong words for the New York Times. But Obama dared not say anything. And when he tripped and accidentally did, he quickly retreated. And that's where we are now, where nobody is willing to say, hey, our political conversation is suffused with racism. Hey, Republican Party, 98% of your officials are white, 90% of your supporters are white. We got a big race problem in society. No one dares say that because they're the ones who are quickly labeled the racist. Right? That is a very, very effective rhetorical strategy. I'm going to wrap up very quickly. Just a quick comment on post-racialism. Post-racialism is Obama's approach to race. Um, unlike colorblindness, he understands that race is institutional. Um, uh, he understands that race is, is rooted in history. But when it comes to what should be done about racial inequality, here's what post-racialism says. Post-racialism says, if you mention race, you will be tarred as a racist. If you try and craft a, pro a program to specifically remedy racial inequality, you will be tarred for pandering to minorities. And the backlash will be so bad that not only those programs will be defeated, but any other liberal efforts you might attempt. So 
better that you not mention race and that you, per, and that you instead pursue general, universal, liberal solutions which will help everyone and will disproportionately help minorities. Right? So a little bit complicated, but, but that's the basic thrust of post-racialism. The basic thrust is, and Obama has said this to black audiences, I can't help just you, but I can help all Americans. And this is going to help minorities uh, disproportionately. Right? So, so this is post-racialism. It says our, the best strategy is not to mention race, but instead to pursue universal liberal solutions. And ultimately, that's actually going to be the best thing we can do for minorities. Right? Now, this is colorblindness. Because at root, what post-racialism says is, for very different reasons, but at root, post-racialism says we can't talk about race and we can't help minorities. Can't talk about race, can't help minorities. That's colorblindness. Now, post-racialism does promise that by not talking about race, it's actually going to help minorities because we're going to pursue these universal liberal solutions. So think about Obamacare. Obamacare is the universal liberal solution that Obama is promising we can nevertheless enact. Has he managed to pursue a universal liberal solution in a way that has saved it from racial attack? No. Obamacare is, uh, Obamacare is the sort of rallying cry around which Republicans justified their shutdown of government and on which they will campaign in 2014, and I bet you in 2016 as well. And it is about liberalism, but it's also about this black president. And it's a sort of quintessential dog whistle uh, 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 confluence. Well, actually, remember, for those of you who were here yesterday, I was talking about the Willie Horton campaign. It was sort of this campaign built around scaring white voters with a picture of a, of a, of a black rapist. And, and, I, and I read a quote in, in, in which an operative from the George Bush administration said, Willie Horton is the perfect combination of liberalism and a big black rapist. Obamacare is the perfect combination of liberalism and a big black president. And Obama cannot respond. He cannot He's going to have a really hard time saving this liberal universal program. And, and beyond this, he's achieved almost nothing. He's going to have a very hard time saving it, exactly because liberalism itself has been racialized. There is no escaping race. But by trying to escape it, all Obama is doing is giving, cre creating a safe space for this sort of dog whistle politics to continue unchallenged. OK, I'll stop there. And thank you all for your patience. Please. I'm wondering, when have you have you seen it or heard of any examples um, that are really that are, would be lessons for us as far as when you do get the standard thing that you said about being called racist because you're supposed to be a racist racism? What would in the political arena? What have you? Have you seen anything that really kind of counter kicks that? Um, so, so, two, so two things. One, I think one of the best responses. So, so what's actually pretty interesting is to watch both uh, John Stewart and Stephen Colbert deal with race, right? Because they're actually successfully countering it through the same basic technique. So, so the, the technique of, being, uh, of saying I've been called a racist is to insist on the absurdity of the proposition, right? It, it's to say, you know, it's John McCain to say, he called me a racist. A as if racist must mean um, a spittle spewing bigot, right? And everybody can tell that McCain wasn't that sort of a racist, so, that, so the charge just seems absurd. Right? So, so that there's a sense that it's like it's the absurdity of it that helps defeat it with very little room to say, well, what might racist mean? And you can't, you can't even have that conversation. So you can see that sort of this attempt to come back and, and, and ridicule the absurdity of the claims being made um, uh, of, you know, about, about, whether, you know, about whether it's racism or, or whatnot. So, so one thing is just to, so one response is, 
you got to take it on, but you can you can take it on by emphasizing its own absurdity, right? And 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 the whole craziness of it. And so one of the things that I've taken. So whenever somebody says you're racist, one of the things I I, I say is, um, uh, does a person who calls nine is you know is a, is the person who calls nine one one is that the criminal? Is the person who pulled a fire alarm are they the arsonist? It's crazy to say the racist is the person who mentions race. Talking about a social problem is not the same thing as as perpetrating it. Right? And so you just kind of laugh at it, just keep moving. That's one comment. Second comment. Um, uh, some very interesting studies suggest that if you call race to the fore, even if people don't believe you, they slow down. Right? So, so if you say, hey, this is racial pandering, this is, this is racial demagoguery, this is dog whistle politics, you guys are trading on race, you may get a lot of pushback. But at least when people think about illegal alien or Muslim terrorist or all of these terms, they're now being forced to think, I wonder if this is about race. And they may ultimately say, no, I don't think it is. But that's much more, uh, there's progress there relative to people hearing about illegal alien, Muslim terrorist, crackhead, all of those terms, and never wondering whether race is infecting their decisions. Right? And so, it, it, so I, I, uh, 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 there's research that suggests there's progress even in forcing people to confront whether race is at work, even if there's a lot of pushback and people say, don't be absurd. So. Well, one issue that we don't see is that Original story of the enslavement of people, uh, the prison system, the, the prison labor, and, and contemporary racism that has perpetuated this global prison industrial system, which under the contemporary politicians has grown exponentially. Right. I mean, you have even geo funding going to Chuck Schumer and right. Marco Rubio and everybody else. Have you discussed that at all? Because it's part of that old story, isn't it? Yeah. The story of bringing people under chains or locking them up and securing the rest of the society from these people. Yeah, I know it, it really is. So, so I'm a big fan of Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But what I what I don't think she does well is really explain how racism shifts. Right? So, yes, I think there's important continuity from, from slavery to debt punitive and convict leasing to Jim Crow to racialized mass incarceration. But at the same time, there are shifts in how race is being used and, uh, um, uh, uh, and how racism is working. And so that's the story I'm trying to tell. It, it's one of continuity, but it's also one of saying, we are a very different society now than we were 100 years ago. Um, very few people would countenance slavery, would countenance the brutality of debt peonage or convict leasing. And yet, a majority of Americans are willing to pay no attention to the brutality and inhumanity of mass incarceration. So what has happened? And, and what I'm saying <coughs> is these old narratives of, of fear and threat have been repurposed and reinvented. Um, uh, but when we watch those narratives, the point now is not the appropriation of labor as it was in slavery, convict labor, or debt peonage. Now what's at stake is political power and attacks on New Deal liberalism. And so, you know, people who try and understand uh, mass incarceration and try and give a materialist account of mass incarceration I have to say, well, well, in some way, is there is the labor of all of these people, these millions of people, being appropriated somehow? And yes, there's prison labor, but it's you know, not big. Um, um, I think it's important to emphasize that there's now a prison industrial complex, and people are making a lot of money, and prison guard unions making a lot of money, and so there are sort of material interests fighting for this for the continuation of, of these institutions. That's not the main story, though. The main story is the material interest is not is not anymore in labor, anymore in the profit of the prisons. The main interest is in the way in which steering people about crime uh, uh, um, bamboozles people into voting for, for politicians who are actually intent on dismantling the New Deal. And that's what's at stake. So I had a comment on that and a question. The comment says how the rhetoric of slavery, I mean, you see it in popular culture and 
yeah. Django Unchained and other other situations. I haven't seen the recent movie, but you know, you mentioned the, Clarence, the Fisher decision. And, you know, Clarence Thomas had a concurrence where he likened affirmative action to slavery. Exactly. Right? I mean, so it's sort of this dependency. So there's this crude sociology of dependency there, sort of having this revisionist view of slavery that they now apply to these. I was kind of taken aback by that. But my question, though, is I, I read your book. I'm looking forward to reading your book, but I read your comments as how the right has attacked liberalism or is trying to undermine liberalism through the charges of racism based on a colorblind principle. But I mean, you go back to Johnson. I mean, Johnson is sort of missing your story a little bit. And there are a lot of you know, people on the left who would accuse his policies of being sort of racist. I mean, Johnson arguably also was a racist I mean, in, in terms of his views. So I wonder how that part of the narrative, in other words, you know, the criticism of, from the left of liberalism as racism is that it's you know, assimilationism, that, that itself is a form of colorblindness, even though the right wouldn't view it. It's not colorblind enough for the right, but the charge is that it's assimilation or colorblindness and not really pluralistic, right? So I was just wondering how charges of these liberal policies from the left would fit into your, uh, yeah, is, is, it, is it a situation where you have these very strange bedfellows that are just you know, creating this, um, uh, what, what's the right word, kind of disharmony or um, dysfunction in how we can have progressive reform? Or is there you know, kind of a counter narrative that, that could be developed there? Well, I, so I think it's a great question. Here's the way I think about it. I, I, think it's, I think it's a huge dilemma why Democrats have been so ineffective in responding to a sort of a, a, a racial politics that is so obvious and so devastating and, and, and so persistent. And, and yet the Democrats just keep folding over. And, and why is that? And, and in this talk, I sketched one answer. And I said, well, partly it's because the, the, the conservatives have a really powerful sort of rhetorical strategy. And it has cowed the Democrats. But there actually may be a more fundamental answer. And, 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 and it's this. Liberal elites themselves draw on common sense racism. And when they do, the result is that a lot of the charges being made by dog whistle politicians that minorities are a threat resonate with, with liberal elites. They, they don't see that as racial demagoguery. Well, they see it as, as a little bit of racial demagoguery. They don't see the whole thing because they themselves are discomfited by integration in the Northeast, um, or fearful of minority crime, or unfamiliar with any Mexican-Americans, let alone certainly no undocumented immigrants, right? So, so these rhetorics have tremendous power. And I think it is led, well, in, in the book I call it Thomas Edsel in particular for his book, Chain Reaction, I think it has led democratic strategists to understand what has been strategic racism as instead natural reaction. Democrats tend to see um, white flight from the Democratic Party and white realignment with the Republican Party as <laughs> an inevitable natural reaction to Democratic excesses in the 60s and 70s. And when they see it that way, uh, they, they, do, they come up with a couple of self-defeating solutions. Self-defeating solution number one is, this will stop happening to us as soon as we jettison blacks. Right? And, and, and this is Bill Clinton. As, as, if, I, if I can target blacks, and, and you know, in a sense, uh, he was right, he was elected. I mean, there's complications there. But, but um, in another sense, he had to stop being a Democrat in order to be elected. So, so one self-defeating solution is we just won't do anything for minorities anymore. The other self-defeating solution is to think in the long term, since this is just a natural reaction of bigots, the bigots are going to die pretty soon. And eventually when they die off, we're going to be OK. But this doesn't capture what's happening. So, so, we're, so, so maybe that may, so, so Edsel wrote in, in 90, I think. Maybe that was plausible in 90. But this is 2013 now. And white opposition, white hostility towards liberalism and, and towards the Democratic Party is almost as high as it's ever been. I think uh, when you think about the, the, the deficit, 20% um, uh, more uh, whites voted for Romney than they did for, for Obama. 
Um, uh, Ronald Reagan's re-election was higher. Richard Nixon's re-election was higher. That's it. Uh, otherwise, this is as high as it's ever been, right? So, so this theory that, that this is a natural backlash and that A, we could just mimic it, and B, it doesn't matter in the long run because demographics are going to save us, it's completely naive. But I think it, it, and it helps us explain why Democrats have been so slow to react to it. They, they, sympathizing with the basic narratives, they haven't seen it as a manufactured anxiety. They've seen it instead as a natural reaction. I'd like to jump in there because um, so there's something about this talk. I mean, I love the talk just as I loved yesterday's talk, and there's something I think about yesterday's talk that didn't make enough of a transition to this one. In the following sense, I mean, you started out talking about um, strategic racism as being this conscious manipulation of racial animosity aimed at at, at um, contests over status, power, and wealth, right? I, I completely agree, and I think that's a fabulous formulation. But it somehow, I think it helps to explain what you were just talking about in a following sense, that because there's not been enough of a challenge to actual existing distribution of power, status, and wealth, that people are much more vulnerable and susceptible to, these sort, these, to strategic racism. Because there's, there's not enough of a, a, an alternative being offered that would correct the, the inequalities that exist in society, that would address, and again, you know, in the last 40 years, what we've seen for the vast majority of people, working people, is that their status has declined, right. if anything, as you started out by saying. Right. Um, because there's no real challenge to that, mm -hmm. they're much more susceptible then to these racial appeals and it serves to create a vicious circle that perpetuates itself right. because it, it leads to even more inequality, therefore more susceptibility right. to this. Right. So Democrats, I, I think I was talking to Richard about this after your lecture yesterday. To me, a good example to illustrate this is the 1988 campaign of Jesse Jackson, which was very different than his 84 campaign because he was much more of an economic populist mm -hmm. at that point. And he was, it was therefore a much stronger campaign. He got labor support. And I think he was also much more profoundly threatening mm -hmm. to the powers that be within the Democratic Party. And there was a lot of effort to scuttle that campaign, mm -hmm. including by people like Mario Cuomo and mm -hmm. Al Gore. And I think so it's when there's a challenge mm -hmm. to this question of status and power and wealth that actually there's much more at stake, they're much more at stake. And um, there's a reluctance to talk about those sorts of things, which translates then into a, a vulnerability on these issues. Right. It's, it's also the case that I think that Obamacare is very vulnerable on this point because it's really not perceived as a universal program. Right. It's really not, I think, in practice, challenging status, wealth, and power. And um, it, it, it's very vulnerable in that regard. And it's interesting, too, that the other parry that, that um, Democrats are susceptible to is the class warfare uh, one, where any time anybody talks about inequality, they say, oh, class warfare, and everybody backs off. When, so it's exactly analogous. Um, anyway. I, I agree. I really agree with, with everything you've said. So I would, I would say it this way. The Democrats and the New Deal had a strong rhetoric of, of of class status and wealth um, uh, by talking about concentrated capital as a threat to the middle class. That began to lose purchase, I think, as this racial rhetoric emerged. Panicked, the Democrats have largely adopted Republican rhetoric. Right? And so, so one of the stri striking things about Obama is he, like the, like the Republicans, goes around saying the biggest threat to us is budget deficits. That's Republican rhetoric. That's the rhetoric of a looming threat from government. So that the Democrats abandoned the rhetoric that, that they had and that proved so effective. And, and I think um, it's going to be crucial for the Democrats to begin to say, this is about power, status, and wealth. We need to think about the threat to the, to the middle class from concentrated wealth. We need to understand that that threat often comes through a manipulation of racial animosity, but 
this isn't, and, and here's where I think it's really an appeal to all Americans as a way of saying white Americans, this isn't first and foremost a racial justice campaign. It's first and foremost an economic justice campaign in which addressing racism is an essential component. Right? And, and, and in that sense, I think that there's um, not just the, the language of FDR, but I think the, the language of the late MLK and the Poor People's March. You need an interracial justice movement for economic justice. Or like Jackson or ja or Jackson and the Eden. rainbow. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. But that's, again, it's really threatening to a lot of people for, I mean, within the Democratic Party and who's calling Good. the shots, right? Good. Yes, hopefully. <laughs> well, so to that point, so as these different groups that we're seeing uh, who've been, been yeah, I guess, very politically active um, in the past two elections, um, Latinos, African Americans coming up to vote, as I guess they begin to get more and more politically powerful, if that's kind of how you know you would assume it would progress, um, if that if it progresses that way, um, how do you think the Democratic Party is going to adapt to that? You know, how will they try to accommodate these different voices? I mean. To the extent that the Democratic Party is pretty much, um, it's run by you know again powerful wealthy whites. Right. I mean, what what's the future look like for the Democrats? So 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 I think that, that we're we're going to see more of the same in which the Democratic leadership says to itself, blacks and browns don't have an alternative. We we can't mistreat them because then they won't go to the polls, but we don't actually have to do anything for them because Republicans are even worse to, for them, right? And so there's, a, there's a, a, a dynamic of taking blacks and browns for granted. And, and I think that that dynamic, there's no reason that dynamic isn't going to continue. What would change it is if the political mobilization in the black and, and Latino communities was a, was a mobilization around economic justice and anti-racism rather than a mobilization for the Democrats. Because then there'd be pressure, right? Then there'd be pressure to say, these people are actually mobilizing against the Democratic Party, this sort of Jackson 88 or MLK, Poor People's March. Um, that's gonna take a lot of education, that's gonna take a lot of organizing, but I think that's the point at which the Democratic Party would say, if we want black and brown votes, we might actually have to change who our candidates are and what our platform is. So when the candidates start speaking the rhetoric of Barack Obama, who has been like very good at you know adopting Republican rhetoric, right? I just use that. I, mean, I, just, I think that. Do you think that is our future? Just you know, getting people who, on the surface, they're minorities, but they still have this uh, similar you know white wealthy Democrat mentality. Uh, so the future is unclear. I, I take I take hope from the sort of grassroots energy that you see. I mean, that you saw here in Wisconsin, that you that you see in the Occupy movement. Um, but in the absence of that grassroots mobilization, yeah, I think that's our future. The, the sort of Cory Booker's, right. Barack Obama's, this new generation um, who trade on their race to actually become even less connected to minority communities because they assume that they've got those votes sewed up and now they just have to try really hard not to alienate any whites centrist. while they, yeah. centrist, which ends up being moderate Republican. Right. Okay. Yeah, well, I was just thinking about um, the inability of Democrats to respond and the sort of self-flagellation that's been going on over the Obamacare website. And John Stewart really got it right, talking about um, the absurdity of the newest conservative talking point comparing the website to Katrina. And I was just wondering if you could comment on that, because obviously Katrina has been sort of explicitly racialized. Right, right. Yeah, no, I think that that's right. But, but, but let me give another comment, and, and, and this is what I, I wish were a little bit more in the public conversation. The website is so complicated because Obama compromised with himself and decided instead of a universal payer system, he would build a system of health care reform on an already established, highly inefficient, insurance-based health care system. And once he did that, he condemned this reform to 
complications. I, I wouldn't have said to failure, but but maybe even to failure, right? But but I wish that were more in the in the conversation, because what we're seeing is more and more people, including liberals, uh, Thomas Edsel today in the New York Times, uh, Frank Rich recently in the New York Magazine, saying, this threatens the death of liberalism, and and. I wish, right, because if this fails, this is going to serve as a confirmation that liberalism, the big government, the activist government, is a failure. Um, but I wish they would step back and say, liberalism was jeopardized when Obama failed to act as a liberal and failed to push an effective, simple government solution, right? Maybe based on the VA, right? But but when when once Obama moved away from an effective government provision of health care then we were doomed to a complicated, inefficient, expensive system. If everything worked perfectly. And if it doesn't, we're gonna see a political collapse, right? And, and I wish that was part of the conversation. Okay. Thank you, Doug. Thanks a lot. Right. Thank you all. The, the party is here. And, I, and I do hope to see you at the reception uh, at, at, at Ben's.